Welcome, you're listening to the Player Layer Podcast. I'm your host, Ivan Alexiev, and today I'm very happy to have with me Bruno Faidutti. Uh, he has been a game designer for over 30 years. He's got some great titles and has worked with a lot of other great game designers. Um, his most famous game is probably Citadels, uh, which you should definitely check out. It's amazing how uh, it's a light game, but can go up to um, eight players, but at the same time it has some depth, and that's I think that's part of the established style of Bruno. And it was just fascinating to talk with him because he's not only a game designer, he's also a teacher. He's got a PhD in... Uh, history, he's got a master's in sociology, and it was just fantastic talking to him. So, uh, I uh, hope you will enjoy this episode, but before we get to that, I want to say that this is the very first sponsored episode of the Player Layer Podcast, and it is sponsored by Hero Time Manufacturing. You can find a link below where you can contact them, and tell them, um, just in the promo code section, uh, write Player Layer, and they will know you were sent by us. Uh, what they do is... What they're offering is uh, quotes for games, so if you have a game that you're working on, um, they can give you a quote, they can help you out, they're very good with their communication, um, and they can also recommend all sorts of other services because they also work with um, shipping fulfillment, um, artists, graphic designers, basically anything you need to get your game going, uh, you can go to them and they will um, do their best to help you out. I've been working with them for the past five months or so and I have been extremely happy. Um, so yeah, check out the link below, um, go to the, <laughs> contact them, uh, get a free quote, um, and yeah, make that connection. I think that's a great step for, um, especially first time designers, but, uh, that was the ad. Uh, let's go on and hear the conversation with Bruno. Thank you so much for listening and enjoy. <laughs> game designer many of you probably know uh, from Citadels. Um, he's designed a lot of games in the past over 30 years, I think, of uh, designing yeah. games. I think your first game, Bruno, was in 1984, right? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, 1984. Yeah. So. <laughs> so, Long ago. <laughs> 37 years at this point. It's, um, <laughs> it's a real pleasure for me to meet you. And first of all, how are you doing uh, today? Ah, uh, how am I doing? I'm a bit bored with all this, you know, staying at home, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, like everyone, I don't like playing online, so I'm mostly <laughs> reading books. But uh, I'm playing a bit with friends, but you know, small groups, and I like playing in big groups. But I hope one of these days it will be possible again. <laughs> yeah, I hope so too. And uh, I know that you're not a fan of solo gaming, but it's. Uh... It's yeah. something that that is becoming more widely uh widely Yeah, I know. I, I'm really bad at it. <laughs> yeah. Even two player games I don't like that much. Some of them, but not that much. Mm. So to to start off and I, I usually start off with this question and it is how did you first get into making board games and how did you become interested in it um at for, like the very beginning? Well, I think since I'm more or less 17 or 18, I'm interested in games. Uh, maybe because I didn't play many games as a kid, because, you know, my parents were very political, you know, and games, it's not serious, it has no social utility, you have to think about the world and the reality, and, you know. So when I discovered game and, and literature, more or less at the same time, that it was possible to write books which have no social value and to pre do things which have no social value. It was a revelation for me. And well, I stayed quite political, but I like to have my time for stupid things beside it. And games and novels are this. And so I've I played many kinds of games. I first started with chess. In the late 70s, then I went into role-playing games, and the first board game, it was the time we discovered Cosmic Encounter, and you know, there was also first German-style games, Heron Tortoise, Scotland Yard, Scotland Yard, that kind of stuff. Role-playing games, poker, you know, more or less everything, uh, even LARPs. 
and I think I started to focus more and more on board games because I became tired of role playing games, except to ours. I still play one or twice a year, but not that often. I got bored of chess. I got bored of poker. In fact, I got bored of games which people have to take seriously to play a lot if they want it to be interesting. Yeah. I like games that you can play, you know, just uh, once, twice, three times, and you don't have to be really, you know, into the game. So I spent more and more time on board games, and then I discovered that I was too lazy to write novels, but just enough maybe will and energy to design board game, which is, you know, I, I, I feel like designing board game board, board game is like starting to write a novel and stopping just when the <laughs> really difficult work ought to start, which means stopping at writing. You know, you just design the overall structure and you let players write the story. Mm-hmm. And it's something like this. So, and I like to toy with all these things. And so that's it. I, I've i always been, for always, since I'm, let's say, 15, 7, 16, I've been into many, many kinds of games. Not that much into computer games. I tried, but I think it's not for me because it's so a play mostly. And well, now I have friends in the board gaming world and... Also, it was easy. I think I was in the early 80s and I was in one of the first group who played Dungeons and Dragons in France and who played, you know, the first. So we also got the games from Avalon Hill, et cetera, et cetera. And when a few guys decided to try to import that kind of games in France and to publish that kind of game in France, there were not that many people who knew them and who were able to design something. So that's why, okay, uh, you know, it was, maybe it was 20, 30 people in the room, friends. So uh, so they had to find me and my friend, and it was Pierre Kreker, who's dead now. And we went into this and started to design games together, and, and that's how it started. <laughs> awesome. That's and- it. Yeah, uh, that's that's a fascinating story, and I, I love that um, you mentioned, and I, I read it in your blog, on one side having political uh, kind of thought, and on the other side having games, and I read that you um, you prefer keeping messages out of games, and keeping yeah. games just... Uh... I like to you know, make kind of puns and winks at political things in games. I think it's interesting, but... I am a big reader. I read a lot of novels, and I know that political novels are almost always boring. Uh, when when the writer want to say something, usually it ends up being boring. It ends up being a good novel when he just writing what he wants to write, and that's the way I want to design games. If there is something in them, maybe and you no, know, I, I make wings. I I made you know small references here and there because you know. But mostly because it's fun. But I I think a game with a message will end up being as boring as a novel with a message. And for, from the few games with a message I've played, that's usually what happens. You you have a very interesting perspective because because so many people try and do just the opposite. They try and make this big game, and I, especially now I I find that there's like trends um, towards yep. uh, making large narrative games with like large story arcs and. Uh, and it's very cool if it works. It's something that I haven't played that many. I can say probably Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective is maybe a I, game of that type. I, you cannot imagine how I hate this game. <laughs> because, you know, when it appeared, it was in the it was in the late 80s, time when I was living in Africa, in Togo, so it was not that easy to get games. And I heard that this game is fantastic. This game is fantastic. So I managed to get a copy. And whoa, how boring it was to play. <laughs> I hate this game. <laughs> I think it's a game that requires patience from uh, from players. Yeah, and... Patient enough, yeah. <laughs> Maybe. 
<laughs> and uh, and it, it has changed a lot. I know that the first editions of the game had a lot of spelling mistakes, and uh, but it's it's it, it's definitely a different type of game, you know. So I, I, and uh, another thing I read by you <laughs> today, I just started out my day reading a lot of your your blogs is uh, how you said that in the eighties and nineties board games and gaming in general were kind of finding their grammar. And uh, cool. right now they're more like the, the grammar is already built and games are um, more finding style, different styles and different fashions and things like that. Um, cool. Could you tell me about uh, just how um, different it was designing games then to designing uh, games now? Because you're still doing it, right? Yeah, I'm still doing it. But now I'm focusing on, you know, very, very right things. I think it was different because there were fewer references, fewer games around. So it was it was easier. It was possible to know everything. There was a time in the late 80s, early 90s, when I think I knew more or less everything about games, about board games. And now, you know, I don't know even half of what appears in one day. So it was possible to more or less know everything. And it was possible also to... Well, it was easier to have new ideas, to make new stuff, because, you know, everything had not been made yet. So I think mostly games were not that good if you compare them with what we do now, because, you know, we found a lot of tricks and small stuff and small ways to deal with, you know, with randomness and everything new. Just, just basic idea, like, you know, card drafting from one player to the, to the left, this has not had not been invented. And deck building and, you know, this kind of stuff, which, you know, you just add like this, you know, like putting pepper and salt in a game. Okay, let's put some deck building, let's add this, let's add this. All this didn't exist. So sometimes one invented something, and most times it was, well, I say it was easier because there were fewer things to deal with. And also people were not that difficult. They were accepting games, which now they will feel that, oh, this has not been really play-tested. It's unbalanced. There's too much randomness, etc., etc. It was okay. That's what we had. So we played with it, and, and we had fun. You know, I think my first game, well, except for Nightmare Chess, which was a bit zany, and is, I think is still more or less actual, but... My first game, which I published in the eighties and nineties, I would be ashamed to uh, design something like this now because you know it's they have lots of problems, and simply the way to solve these problems had not been invented yet. Now it's here, so it's better. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely you can you can learn from so many more people, and you can I, part of what I do right now is um, I develop games for people. I help them finish their games. And uh, I can almost always tell when I see a new game whether the designer has played a lot of games or not because uh, you see so you see the solutions. You see... Um, mm. like... and, and I think both ways are interesting probably because yeah. I think people who don't know anything about games, sometimes they have just you know crazy ideas out of nothing that... Maybe they would not have if they had known everything and trying to mix with them. But also sometimes they can be, you know, stupidly blocked by something which has a solution and you know the solution. Yeah, yeah. And now I also very often feel that I'm so much into all this, maybe not theory, but experience and knowledge of board gaming that become really hard to get out of it and make mm -hmm. something new. Yeah. And what I'm designing is probably more derivative than it was before because uh, because I'm too much into into that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and you can you already have a developed style and you already have have those known solutions whilst when you're uh, you're completely new to it. It's And people expect me to design okay, Bruno Feduti games. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and that's sure. probably what i'm best at doing so yeah yeah but also like um like like you said so many games right now wouldn't be a wouldn't be created <laughs> there's there's just not that freedom when there's uh 
when there's such a huge amount of designers and such a huge amount of of games coming out and you can't even know you know everything that's out there you also uh, were one of the first people who um, started reviewing games and recommending them could you tell me about um about how how th- how that became something you did well you know i think because i don't remember exactly when i started this i think probably in the mid 90s you know uh, when i made my idea of game library and it was in this time when i was more or less deliberately trying to have kind of an encyclopedic knowledge of board games, trying to play lots of things. I also always enjoy playing, you know, yeah, new games and discovering what's in them. And so I thought that, okay, I know all that stuff. And it was, of course, it was a way of, uh, making my reputation and showing that I know everything, so I must design good games, etc., etc. But also, I think I had fun making this. I had fun comparing things and trying to find trends and relations between designers and styles. And I think in these times, I was really the, one of the few people who knew enough to do it. And I stopped when when it was not possible anymore to have all this encyclopedic knowledge, uh, I say, okay, it's not possible anymore to, you know, people were asking, what do you think of this game, this game, this game? No, 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 there are too many games. I even, I've even not heard about it. So I stopped everything. And do you think, um, because I know outside of games, you're also, um, you have a PhD in history and um, correct me if I'm wrong, also a, a master's in sociology, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you think that influences you as a game designer or a gamer, or is it something that you've practiced outside of uh, outside of game design? Not that much. I don't think it influences me in, in my game design. I'm mostly. No, I think it's two separate part of my life. Really, I'm. I'm still interested in history. I'm still interested in sociology. In you know in theory in large but and i'm playing games but it's it's not the same well i do i do feel like uh when when i read your uh your blogs there's definitely at least the sociology part i can i can see uh yeah yeah no o- of course you know it's easy to use when writing what you know it's easy to use the theory you know and, and there are fun things that probably to say about you know sociology of gaming etc etc but but it's not my main focus as a historian, I'm not working on the history of gaming. You have so many games that you've worked on, so many games that you've made. I want to ask you about your um, creative process. When you kind of sit down to make a game, uh, what it looks like, is it something that you schedule time for? Um, like, for example, I know B- Bruno Catala, who's, who you've worked with a lot, um, He does. The, it's something that every day he... Um, it's his full-time job, or are you more? Um, do you wait for inspiration, <laughs> or how how is how does the process look like for yes, you? Yes, I, I wait for inspiration. I'm not organized. I have no specific time to work on gaming. I just wait. Sometimes I have ideas. Sometimes I don't. And but it's not something that I really organize. Uh, I heard a great quote today. <laughs> Actually, yeah, that, that's probably why I asked the question about uh, a writer who was asked a similar question. And he said, uh, I wait for inspiration, but it comes every day at 9.30. <laughs> no, it's absolutely not like this for, with me. You know, sometimes it never comes at all. And sometimes everything together. And... No, what I try in when when I'm blocked, when I have no ideas... I look a bit for other designers if they have something they want to work. Well, they are, they are blocked and I might help or I ask for help from them. I believe a lot, you know, in, you know, going back and forth. And that, that's a way which, you know, novelists have not. But I think for game designer, it's possible to go past this writing block with just asking someone else to put a bit of them in it, yeah. which is more difficult with books. That's that's a really good point, uh, which I, I haven't thought of that much. Was just how how much of a cooperative process it can be, and uh, how anyone can kind of give you an idea. I, I feel like even with um, playtesting games, a lot 
um it's when when you're just watching the game you can you get those ideas or when you're or or it's it, it is somebody else who can kind of influence you could you tell me about that process for you of working with other people i know that you've worked with many other designers and um is there a big a large difference between working alone and working with um, other people not that much what's really different is well, it's different because when working with someone, it's more difficult to, you cannot, you know, start again through everything. You know, when I'm working just my best, I have an idea. Okay, let's make something completely different. When working with someone, okay, we have this basis and everyone on the side try to think of it and add something, remove something. So it's usually more more incremental, I think. Uh, that's Probably why, when I look at my last games, I've made few relatively complex big box games this last year. But usually, games I've designed with someone are more these games, and the very very light games are more something I just do my by by myself, because you know it's just one idea. It works, it doesn't work, and but there's also no rules. I think uh, really there's no. I don't have. A, clear process of my way of designing games there's no no clear process yeah do you, do you have a process when uh, of what you look for when you play test or who do you play test with i play test with more or less always with the same friends who are gamers they also play role-playing games most of them they play raps some of them are also game designers either board game or video game designers. So I more or less always play with the same group. I never do, you know, what kind of blind play test, you know, sitting uh, aside and looking at people playing. I'm always in the game. I, I try to play test game like I play games. Mm. When I play test the game, okay, I try to win. And well, if after 10 minutes we see that the game don't work, okay, I will look on my shelves and we will play something else. But, uh, yeah, I, for me, the key of playtesting is it must be just playing. Yeah, I think, I think that's great, uh, a great way to do it <laughs> is, you know, try to find, uh, find if it's fun, I guess. Uh, yeah, and... find it fun and, you know, usually, you know, it's very casual and, you know, I have game nights, but not now. Now it's game afternoons because, you know, you cannot do anything at night, but... In normal times, I have game nights, and game nights, and usually it's not decided if it will be, you know, prototypes, my prototypes of what someone else, or just new games that we've received, or some old games that we want to play. Nothing is decided in advance. We just see. If if you could design any game right now, what what is something that you would really want to do in the future with uh, your personal like design? I don't know. You know, I've. I'm not really bored of making games, but uh, maybe a bit, you know. As this last month, I've not designed a lot. I've mostly reworked old ideas and, you know. And I, I don't know, because as I said, I, I, I wait for inspiration. So I will see. If, if I have a wonderful idea, I will make something out of it. But I don't have a, a goal. Mm. I think I've been successful. I make enough money from games. I don't really need to have new games coming out. So if I have an idea, okay, it's for the best. And if not, never mind. There are also other games to play. I also like to discover new games. And, and you know, in this time, there are so many new games that it's not possible to at the same time, discover all the new games and play test my games. I mean, not enough time. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And it's, uh, I, I think that it's good. Uh, first of all, I, I think that a large place where a lot of designers make, make mistakes is that they keep trying things despite being bored. <laughs> like, I, 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 think that, I think that you always need to keep yourself interested. And if you're not doing that, if you're not having fun with it, I, I think that's, a, that's not a good sign. And usually yeah, it's... Probably. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I really like that about uh, about what you said. Is just if if you don't uh, like, I I think you need to find ways to make it fun for yourself. 
that's that's my personal view, uh, and I'm I'm sure that there's somebody who can probably um, do it otherwise. <laughs> but uh, I think I think we share that uh, that um, thought process. Yeah, it has to be exciting. If if it's not exciting, there's no point in it. Yeah, and that, that's what I really like about you. Probably know Mark Pakian, uh, designer of Treasure Island. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, French designer. He. Um, he said that that's part of why he he doesn't want to make it his full time job, and he he has a different job as uh, he wants to keep it a hobby. And I know a lot of designers that do the same, but for you, it's uh, it's kind of different because you're already so uh, you're you're already very successful. You know, your games are considered uh, I, classic. I, I've kept a part time job. I'm still half time. I I'm still a half time teacher in yeah. high school. I don't know what is my job. I don't know if my job is to design board games or to teach. Mm. Maybe my job is to design board games and teaching is a hobby. Maybe it's the reverse. I, I don't really know. I think it's a problem when you start seeing anything as, as work because <laughs> if, if you can just play, you know, um, no matter what your, your your job is, I think if you, you, you can see a lot of jobs as hobbies, you know, and they're, they're much more fun if... Uh, if you see them as uh, a hobby. And this last time I've started to, you know, the last confinement, I've started to write a big book. Mm. So, okay, so now I'm in this, so I have not as much time as I used to have for designing games, and and it's fun as well. But it's much more work than designing games. <laughs> much, much, much more work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's great when you can kind of ba- balance several things. What are what are some of your favorite games to play now, or um, what have you been playing lately? Well, I think the game we played the most in my game nights or my game afternoon at the moment is uh, probably Cursed Court. Uh, you know, you know this game. It's I have not played it. No, terribly expensive for the components that are in it, yeah. but it's a uh, really great game it's kind of a bidding half bidding bluffing game and i think it's really the one of the very very few games which manages to create same kind of tension uh you have when playing poker without having actual money in it mm. it's very difficult to create that kind of tension without real money and here it works really perfectly and uh, it's really it's really a fantastic game and that's a game we are playing very very often last three also better known we play a lot of uh, quacks of quedlingburg which i like a lot as well it's different it's skype but it's it's really a great game in french it has a really cool french name you know, it, Charlatan de Bocaster. It's it, it's ridiculous. I prefer the yeah, but, well, but it's a great game. Yeah, it, it had the Kenner Spiel two years ago. And it's it's really fantastic. It's not that complex. For me, I think these are the two best games of this last year. Mm. At least among the games I've played, because now there are so many games <laughs> that there are tons of games I've never played. Yeah, I haven't played either of those games, <laughs> and, and and I do uh, board games full time, so it's uh, it's very funny, you know. What is it like pitching to publishers? I know that um, I, I I know that you 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 also know a lot about uh, Kickstarter, which I want to talk about in a, in a minute. But um, first, I, I'd like to ask you kind of how you've pitched to publishers, and uh, if you have any advice for people who. You know, I don't think I would have good advice because it's easy for me to pitch to publishers because they know me, and they know me. They know that I, they know that I write extremely synthetic, clear, and direct rules. All publishers know that I am probably uh, the one game designer where they got the rules, they read them, and they understand everything. And there's almost nothing to rewrite. So they like this. So when I tell them that, okay, I have a game, they are often willing to have a look. So it's easy for me because I'm in the business for long, because my rules are, really, I think the one thing I'm good at, maybe maybe I'm not that good at designing games, but I'm very good at writing rules. So, 
<laughs> and that it helps a lot when uh, looking for publishers. But, for example, I'm very bad at, you know, everything graphic. I don't know how to shoot a video. I've even never done it in my life. Uh, and I think this last time it's the way often people present games and pitch games to publisher, you know, you shoot a small video where you they see you playing your games. It's something I've never done. And, you know, if I were younger, probably I would have to do it. And, okay, well, I don't have to learn this. It's better for me. It's my chance, you know, there are a few advantages of being old. And one of them is that that's all this contact part had become easier. Mm. Maybe not that much now that everything is, you know, done online this last year. It was mostly, you know, on game fair, you know, I just have to come and they always have 10 minutes for me, which is not the case for, for, for someone younger. So if I had an advice for younger people, is it would be to make things direct and simple. Right? You know, very, very short self sheet maybe with short description of the game, very simple rules, a few pictures. Uh, try to pitch your game in two minutes. If you cannot do it in two minutes, it probably means that there is nothing uh, that people won't be excited by it. That would be my advice. Yeah. But, um, but I'm not sure I'm the best uh, at giving advice for this. Because yeah. really my way of doing it is not very, very academic in a way. I don't do sell sheets. I just, you know, write a, maybe 10 line description of the game and I attach the rules and one picture and I say, okay, uh, have a look. You, you like it or not? Are you interested or not? But but it's because I'm in the business for very long. Yeah, yeah. And you already have that name and I think it is, it is quite different for younger yeah, and newer it helps designers. It helps a lot, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. There's a there's a saying you've probably heard. I think my, my my old philosophy teacher used to say it. it it's uh, you work half your life to make your name, and the other half your name works uh, for you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah something you, like this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. yeah, it's it's definitely different, and you d need a lot of skills nowadays. Though it's also just going going to to places like you said, going up to a publisher and showing them what you've got. Um, most of the time, th that publisher, that's going to help you even if, even if it's not uh, with this publisher. Just speaking to them will uh, make you learn more about who who else to speak to or what to change. Like uh, last week, I talked to the designer of Targi. Um, I, you probably know the game. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and he said uh, he said he pitched the game to Cosmos, uh, which is a, a large publisher in Germany. And he sent sent them the rules, and they sent them they sent him a message a couple of months later. Um, we don't understand any of these rules, <laughs> could you, but we think we think there's a game there. So could you uh, rewrite them? And like like uh, he he didn't. I, I'm guessing he didn't have that skill that uh, you have. You know, you have to be able to um, show the game, and uh, people have to understand understand what it is. Tell me about uh, kind of social and, and party games and what you think is important for the genre that you've... Uh, e even games with a large player count, let's see. I think that's uh, something that you've done a lot of. Well, it's very difficult to make two-player games, for me at least, because two-player games have to be balanced. As long as there are more than two players, and the more players there are, the less necessary it is to bring real balance in the game because balance will often create itself between the players. You know, player will manage to arrange things, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's I think it's easier for me, and I like I really like this interaction between players and things balancing themselves and the game creating uh, the balance between the players. And vice versa, uh, and that's why, indeed, most of my games are for many players. I think you know it's strange. I remember in the eighties, 
most games that were published were, it was usually four to six players. Now the standard is three to four. And five players, which was the average number of players for games published in the 80s, now five players, it's a large group. Mm. And I'm still, you know, and I still enjoy playing games with four, five, six players, and even, you know, kind of party games or bluffing games or games that you can play with lots of players. I think it's more fun. When I have game sessions at home, you know, usually very often we are six, seven, eight. I think it's a shame to divide the group. It's always better to try to play all together. And I end up, you know, playing mostly, well, mostly with groups who have well, usually four, five, six, seven, eight players. And, well, and that's fun. And so sometimes I have an idea for a game and, okay, clearly it's a game for a few players. Okay, let's do it that way. But most times, uh, I think I prefer games that play with more players, mm-hmm. both to play and to and to design. Yeah. And I like party games, you know, uh, games like Just One. I like a lot, you know. We played a lot of them, and even stupid games like Cards Against Humanity. Okay, I won't play it. I play, I played it maybe five or six times, and it's enough. Uh, nothing more in it. But this five or six times where we regret. Uh, and, you know, I've designed this stupid uh, Kama Sutra game. I don't know if you've seen this yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, well, it's just fun. And I, I like games where well, players just have fun. Mm. Um, I don't design only games like this. You know, I recently I made this uh, vintage, which is very serious, in fact, uh, or tonary, but. But I also have like games which are just for fun, not to be taken seriously. Yeah, yeah, and and I think you also I hate I hate I don't like gaming sessions where players don't drink. <laughs> I really like to drink when playing. I like when everybody drinks a bit. And it also means that we cannot be for, you know, six hours in a very, very serious game. It doesn't work. Uh, it can be for uh, two first hours and then it has to be lighter stuff. Yeah, yeah. No, I completely understand. And and um, I think I, I like that you kind of design games that you need with your group. Like you said, we, we usually, we're usually more than four people, so that's why. Yeah, I, I mostly design the game I want to play. It's, you know, that's that's what's interesting. I've worked a lot these last years with someone I really like, um, Anja Vrede. She's a German game designer. And she makes mostly children games. And we've designed a few games, and including children games. But it's it's a bit difficult for me to design children games because I'm not a young child. I don't know exactly how to play them. I vaguely remember when I was young, but not that well. So it's, I have to think differently than the way I think naturally. And it's not something I'm used to in designing games. Yeah. And I think Anya is much better at this. She, she can jump into a kid's uh, brain and, you know, and imagine what they will do with it. And it's something, it's not that easy for me. Yeah, cer- certainly they're not going to be drinking while... Uh... <laughs> no, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah I'm, uh, you, you won't have that crutch to help you <laughs> help you with the uh, bad game design. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm, I'm dealing with this exact same thing right, right now with a children's game. It's my very first attempt at... Uh, at having to think like a, a, a kid and uh, I'm not sure if I'm doing it well. I don't know. We'll, f- <laughs> we'll find out. Because <laughs> a lot of times I just ask myself the question, like, is it is is the child going to remember this or is it uh, is it too complicated or is it is it too simple? And it's like, I don't know. 
I, I hope to I, I hope that it works out, but it's it's very challenging to have to think for an audience that's not yourself, or uh, and and again, you I, personally, I try to make it still for myself, uh, even you know. But I do the same. Uh, I think I can play these games, but even when they are not as interesting as bigger ones. Yeah, and I know I've heard uh, I've heard from children's authors of books. That uh, I know that sometimes it's much harder just because you need to always keep it interesting to you know because if, if the, I think the, the big difference between a child and an adult is the child is much it's much easier for a child to give up before it reaches the end whilst yeah. uh, sometimes like we would watch an entire movie knowing at the fifteen minute mark that uh, it's become boring and it's like no I need to finish it you know just because uh, and children aren't like that. Even they don't need to finish it. It's boring. They stop. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I can certainly see how it's uh, it's it's a difficult task. But with with board games, uh, you need to do the same. I think even with adult board games and keep it cool. keep it engaging, especially now. Like what you said earlier about um, about games like chess, where you have perfect information and you have mastery, and uh, you know you you can play a ga- that game for years. And still, the the better player is always gonna um, always gonna win. Um, yeah, you know, I, I always say that you now that a game where the best best player wins, it's a bug because it knows you know it's it's like first player wins. You know who wins. So best player wins. It's exactly the same as first player wins. It's a bug. You, it's it, it's good that the best player has more chances of winning, but it's necessary that. Everybody can try to win. That's why I think that I have many games which have some hidden information or lots of hidden information and situation where until the end, you don't know completely what is happening with other players because it's not a problem if after three turns you've lost, if you don't know about it. If you don't know that the other players are doing really much better, or they they have put the trap just where you want to go and you will be fucked, it's not a problem. If you don't know about it, you still have fun playing. But if you know about it, if you know that you're losing, it's not fun anymore. So that's why it's either the game has to be really, really balanced until the end and everything, in fact, happens in, at the end, or there has to you have to have some, has to be some mystery. You don't know exactly what's happening with the other players. Yeah, for sure. What and they have talk, what cards they have, etc., etc. Yeah, and when, when a game like ch- chess, it, it, it turns, it does turn into like a sport, you know, it, it's, uh, yeah, it's, yeah it's, it, it becomes can, a sport. Yeah, it, it, it can be like beautiful to watch, uh, like great players, but it's, uh, it's certainly not. <laughs> as engaging or or it's 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 a different different than just playing a game where like uh we're we're much more used to games where you can sort of hopefully in the first game you can understand even better yeah. if in the first round you understand how to play and then you you have fun the rest of the time because it is entertainment you know you know if it's all perfect information then it becomes kind of work i like that you cannot play you cannot plan everything from the beginning and say, I will do this. You have to adapt uh, to the new situation. Something unexpected happen. You can change or not, and you don't know exactly what will be possible. You have to... I think in games you have to expect the unexpected, and that's, that's what's interesting. Yeah, yeah, finding that um, balance. Do do you like the game Dune? By the way, I just wanted to ask you because I, mean, I know that you're a fan of Cosmic Encounter. I think well, I've played it a lot thirty years ago. <laughs> I think I didn't like it as much as Cosmic Encounter, but we played it a lot because we had all the uh, all the games, all the Ian and Avalon Hill games, and I remember playing a lot of Dune, but. I've always felt that it was kind of watered down version of Cosmic Encounter, you know, taking just a few things. It's even even when you play dunes, you can guess 
that the game has been designed and playtested with components from Cosmic Encounter because you have these discs. It's obvious that there were the planets from the original games, etc., etc. So it's it's obvious, and it's really like one of the possible a good one, but one of the possible uh, starting situation of Cosmic Encounter. But with Cosmic Encounter, you have a million ones. Some are worse, but you have millions. Yeah, I wanted to ask you that because that that's another game that I think. Um, to me, it's maybe the most thematic game, the the most where I feel like, like the novel, you know, like, uh, I feel like they really went for... Um... It's strange, I didn't feel it like... It. Really? I'm, I'm not a fan of the novel. Mm. Uh, I liked it. I think I read uh, even the follow-ups which have been made. I liked it as a teenager, but I was not a big fan. No, for I think the game... For me, it feels a bit abstract. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. The novel is certainly political, though, which uh, <laughs> you talked yeah, about keeping keeping not novels in politi- politics. But yeah. <laughs> 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 all right. So, kind of to to finish up uh, the interview, uh, I want to ask you something that I ask all designers, um, and that is, what would be your um, advice, just general advice, towards people who want to design games? Um, just to, or who haven't started making games? Well, don't give up your day job <laughs> <laughs> because you no, know, maybe you will be a great designer. You know, to become successful at game design, I think now you have first to be a good game designer, and second to just to be extremely lucky. So even when you are certain that you are a good game designer. Maybe you won't be lucky. So just keep your day job and try. If it works, when you will get enough money, 10 years in 10 years, maybe you will quit your job, but keep it at first. I think that's the most important advice. Mm. Yeah, it's definitely good advice. It's realistic (laughs) advice. (laughs) Yeah, and hopefully it doesn't deter too many people from... uh... <laughs> from going into it, but uh, I I think it's also um, if you go into it with the mindset of this, I'm gonna make this into my job. Uh, it might work out, it might not. So I I think uh, yeah, yeah yeah I think it's good advice for sure. Well, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to talk to me. You're welcome. It was really a pleasure. It was a pleasure as well.